Okay, so I'm having you read the chapter Gone with the Wind, The Invisibility of Racism in American History Text, because it shows how whiteness is centered in the way we are taught US history. This is a textbook that I have had all three of my children read because I think it's important for them to be cognizant of what they are and are not being taught. I think it's especially true for students who want to do well in school because they'll commit to learning the material to earn a good grade and as a consequence may not take the time to reflect on um, the content that they're learning critically, right? Because they're, they're preoccupied with trying to do well and score well. So recall that in, according to conflict theorists, segmentation exists in all social organizations and societies. We are a society of more than 320 million and we are segmented by state, by region, by age, by gender, by race, by our location within the economy and other ways as well. Um, all of those different segments um, shape our understanding of and our experience, experiences within the human social world. Historical event, events can actually be reported from multiple vantage points, right? From each of those segments or intersections of those segments, um, we can tell and, and talk about historical events from those different vantage points, which which would shape our understanding of um, our history. Um, but uh, conflict theorists point out that uh, historical events for or historical events in textbooks um, are often presented in a way that legitimizes those who are already in power and, th and those who already have privilege. Uh, we saw that in Anion's work where capitalism and capitalists were um, privileged in the recapping of how our economy changed um, during the period following the Civil War all the way through to World War I. And I'm having you read Lowen's work because his work shows us how whiteness is privileged in the telling of historical events in the textbooks, again, kind of during that period of time. Again, conflict theorists say that this happens because the ruling ideas of the time are the ideas of the ruling class. They have the power and the capacity um, to shape perceptions. So, you know, when Lowen talks about whose history counts in his earlier chapters, he talks about how political leaders are um, not only centered, they are herofied. Um, they're whitewashed. Um, the textbooks often hide our leaders' flaws, their shortcomings. Um, and because textbooks do that, um, they are presented as kind of like these mythical, greater than life, you know, more exceptional than exceptional human beings, um, much, I mean, even more so than like regular human beings. And because of that, you know, we're actually less likely to see ourselves or those around us as people who um, should or could assume leadership roles. He also writes about how non-Hispanic whites are centered in the telling of U.S. history, which inevitably leads to erasing or minimizing the historical experiences of Black people and other people of color. Um, for his book, he conducts a content analysis of 12 widely used U.S. history high school textbooks. Um, three of them were published in the 1970s, seven were published in the 1980s, and two were published in the 1990s. He concludes that our public school textbooks do a poor job addressing racism and Black-white uh, race relations. He says that most textbooks present slavery as a sectional problem, not as a national problem. In other words, you know, slavery is something that took place in the South rather than looking at how all parts of our nation and our national history are intimately connected to um, slavery and, you know, by extension, white supremacy. Um, he talks about how the textbooks do not address racism directly. Um, they do not address how overt acts of violence go hand in hand with racism. Um, he says that they don't address white complicity in racism, racial violence, or racial racist acts. Um, and he says that the textbooks do not address how slavery has affected and continues to affect white people. Uh, he says that 
while textbooks have largely abandoned overt white supremacist ideology and language, thank you to the civil rights movement, um, he says, okay, so while that is true, the way that the historical events are discussed um, still passively perpetuate white supremacy. Okay, he highlights how textbooks erase the centrality of racism and slavery in our history. For example, textbooks don't talk about how half the founding fathers were slave owners. He finds that Thomas Jefferson is presented as someone who is torn over slavery, when in fact, Jefferson actually advocated for the expansion of slavery. I looked at the section of the textbook I shared with you from Anion's write-up, and here you see um, the writing about Jefferson's responsibility in drafting the Declaration of Independence. This excerpt includes a discussion of how his first draft included an attack on the cruelty and injustice of the slave trade, but um, how Jefferson dropped the quote unquote offending passage. You can see here the focus on the attack, the focus on the attack of the slave trade was removed to gain votes from two states, but the passage also says nothing of his advocacy for allowing an internal slave trade or not just allowing, but advocating for an internal slave trade. Um, he writes about how the presentation of Abraham Lincoln um, is often done and in contrast with Stephen Douglas, right, who is pro-slavery, um, and how the student audience is shielded from Lincoln's own white supremacist ideology. He also writes about how Woodrow Wilson's racism is not addressed, though Wilson was a Southerner from the state of Virginia, which had some of the most severe black codes in our country. Um, and even though Wilson actually resegregated the civil service, um, which again is like the federal employees, and they had actually been integrated since the civil war. So that's a pretty big deal when you have the resegregation um, of, of workers uh, that work for the federal government and it's not actually discussed in the text. Um, and, and so that erasing of racism and um, slavery is something that Lowen says exists in our textbook. And I actually took a screenshot of this um, because if you'll notice the date, June 30th, 2022, this is right before summer two um, was scheduled to um, start. And what happened was a group of educators had suggested that the social studies curriculum committee um, uh, use involuntary relocation instead of using the term second uh, slavery for second grade curriculum. Um, that's on top of previous recommendations where people were asking, instead of talking about the Atlantic slave trade and calling it the Atlantic slave trade, um, that we refer to it as a triangular trade. So again, even kind of removing that the 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 terms from the content is is a kind of gross erasure, right? So um, I just wanted to include this here because I was like, oh my gosh, I cannot believe that. I mean, I can believe it's happening, but uh, again, like the stuff is still ongoing. Lowen talks about how our U.S. history books do not acknowledge the role and the centrality of the role of slavery and racism in shaping our foreign policy. Um, the Declaration of Independence was really a, like a radical document in inspired revolutions around the globe in our nation's backyard, as well as the rest of the Americas. You know, the Haitians actually invoked the ideals espoused in our own Declaration of Independence. And, you know, they rose up against France um, from 1791 to 1804. This was a slave-led revolution. Um, the slaves asked for our support and we turned our back on them and sided with the imperialist France. The Haitian Revolution actually freaked out our American leaders. They were worried that if our slaves learned about the Haitian Revolution, our slaves might too be inspired to revolt. And so the United States actually became avid supporters of France and undermined Haiti's attempt to be a successful sovereign nation as it pursued its inalienable rights. And, you know, when we look at the uprisings that happened in Latin America against the Spanish and the, and the Portuguese imperialists, um, we actually sided with the oppressors as well in, in those realms too. Now these revolutions were Creole in, in that, you know, people were mixed. Um, 
and we like mix a combination of right indigenous and then the and then the you know the colonizers um but we turned our back on their self-determination um and sided with the imperialist and i mean truth be told we actually wanted to be the imperialist um of north and south america you just have to look at the you know um the material on manifest destiny and and not wanting other nations to get involved in what we were doing you know here um moreover we made we had we dedicated many resources and put a a huge amount of effort into policing our borders but we were preoccupied with policing our borders because we wanted to prevent slaves from escaping to Canada and Mexico and Haiti, right where you know slavery was, had been abolished um, or outlawed, um, and we even entered into treaties. When we when we entered into treaties with Native Americans, we often made one of our conditions of the treaties be that Native Americans had to return runaway slaves to their owners. You know, slavery and racism played such a prominent part of our foreign policy and our engagement with um, sovereign nations, right? First nations. So, so much so that to omit that, right? To not acknowledge it when we're teaching our US history is really doing a disservice in helping people understand how powerful of an institution slavery was in, in shaping our, our policies. And because we don't learn about it, we don't appreciate like the lasting effect that it has, not just on our social institutions, but on um, populations, uh, both black and white, and then people who didn't neatly fit into those categories, right? But how, um, how racism uh, impacts us and, and continues to impact us, um, yeah, and, and, and our life chances. Um, in his analysis on reconstruction, he, I should say, he also analyzes how reconstruction is taught or what's inside the textbooks. Uh, he says that the more contemporary textbooks are less explicitly white supremacist, um, but they are still in, invoking a white supremacist point of view. He says that the textbooks present part of the story of reconstruction as needing to help black people integrate into the United States as equals. He said that black people were still painted as, or he found that black people were still painted as dependent, needing help from white Americans. Um, look at this excerpt here from the Americans textbook. Again, the one that I've been using since the Anion piece. It has the personal voice of William Beverly Nash. Um, and it's right, this is his own voice. And he says, we are not prepared for this suffrage, but we can learn Give a man tools and let him commence to use them. And in time, he will earn a trade. So it is with voting. We may not understand it at the start, but in time, we shall learn to do our duty. And so even this piece um, here is an excerpt using a Black voice to, put, to paint Black people as dependent and ignorant and needing help. This is a white supremacist point of view. And uh, Lowen says, Black ignorance was not the problem during Reconstruction. White violence was the problem that limited Black people's civic participation. The KKK, a white supremacist domestic terrorist organization, began during Reconstruction. White people beat and murdered Black people trying to exercise their rights as citizens, right? Their right to vote, their right to work, their efforts to educate themselves. White people acted and committed mob violence. Um, bombed and burned schools and churches where Black people went to learn. You know, Lowen provides multiple examples, one of which includes in the summer uh, and fall of 1968 in Louisiana, where white Democrats killed over a thousand people, mostly Black people and white and white Republicans. Again, so violence is a is part and parcel um, and it accompanies racism and racist ideology. Lowen says that the issue was not integrating African Americans after the Civil War. The issue was integrating Confederates. But again, by painting one of the challenges of Reconstruction um, as having to help Black people and not in talking about having to deal with violent Confederates, we perpetuate white supremacist ideology even without directly invoking it. 
Um, I did want to show you um, this image of the table of contents in the Americans textbook. Um, during this period of time, um, they include that time that uh, Lowen defines as the nadir. That's the period following reconstruction, which ended in 1877. Um, the period 1890 to 1920 has been referred to as the nadir or the great nadir, and is the time when race relations declined. It was a period of time when after the federal government re like retracted from the South and stopped using its power to uh, stopped using its power affirmatively, affirmatively for the black community, the white supremacists re-seized the levers of power and economically, socially, and politically marginalized African-Americans, reversing many of the gains they made during Reconstruction. Segregation increased in the North and the South. Um, think back to what you learned during Lipsis's work around restrictive covenants. Lowen notes that some of the texts show some Black exclusion, but that these texts do not offer sociological definitions of segregation. When people had to... Um, and, and basically that's like when people had to do equal tasks, you know, just like living your lives, the groups were to be segregated so that, you know, we couldn't see ourselves doing, you know, things that regular humans do. Um, and then when people of different races had to interact with one another, um, that those interactions needed to be hierarchical, requiring white people to be in positions of power and authority with the ability to exercise their power and authority over themselves, but also being able to exercise power and authority over black individuals. The text low and say never really point out the worsening of race relations, though it did show some black exclusion or they did show some black exclusion. And so what I wanted to call your attention to here is uh, chapter eight. You can see that there's actually uh, four pages that are dedicated to this section. You've got segregation and discrimination it begins on page 286 and then you've got the supreme court decision plessy versus ferguson on page 290 and then the next section the dawn and mouse culture is 292 so that's that's four pages right there that are dedicated to black exclusion and so i wanted to show you two of those pages um and in and in the, this section you can see that there's a header or a little subheading that says violence um and so let's just let's just go through that. African Americans and others who did not follow the racial etiquette could face severe punishment or death. All too often, blacks who were accused of violating the etiquette were lynched. Between 1882 and 1892, more than 1,400 African American men and women were shot, burned, or hanged without trial in the South. Lynching peaked in the 1880s and 1990s, but continued well into the 20th century. And so Lowen actually talks about in his write-up how we don't ever see the, perp the perpetrators of violence, that the passive voice is used and we see things happening or read about things happening to Black people, but the perpetrator remains invisible. And that's the case here, right? Because you've got all this passive voice, right? They could face severe punishment. Were, you know, Blacks who were accused of, who did the accusing? Right, we don't have we don't have the actor in the sentence. Um, they were lynched, right? Um, were shot, burned, or hanged, right? Um, and so again, you you don't see white complicity in um, the telling. It's inferred, but again, they're not the actors, and so we're not we're not forced to actually contend with with that issue. So. Lowen actually, you know, closes his chapter talking about how without having a causal historical analysis, the contemporary racial dispar disparities that we see, like what the racial inequalities that we see today are nearly impossible to explain. Because then, you know, what we want to do is attribute the differences in power, wealth, and prestige to differences in culture. But history tells us that there's policies and right um and laws and regulations that actually contribute to what we're seeing today um he closes the chapter with this statement he says educators justify teaching history because it gives us perspective on the present if there is one issue in the present to which authors should relate the history they tell the issue is racism but as long as history textbooks make white racism invisible in the 19th century neither they nor the students who use them 
will be able to analyze racism intelligently in the present. This book is really such a good read. Um, if I had one recommendation of a book that that you know you should read, I would like to encourage you to take a look at this one. There's definitely more um, articles that have been done that looked at, that look at uh, or more contemporary articles that have been done that look at the representation of race um, and different racial and ethnic groups um, in our contemporary history books. Um, but this piece, this book just does such a good idea. I mean, just does such a good job in um, helping us think about the way history is told um, and taught in grades K through 12. Um, and so I'm going to stop there. And I really hope you take the time to read the chapter um, thoroughly. Uh, I know my girls would start off kind of resistant to having to, to read these this book. Um, but they too found it super engaging and illuminating. And I, I know you will too. All right, we're going to stop there.